Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 34, Comic Books, Oregon Trail, Post Office, and the Telegraph. Pseudo-history claims there's a conspiracy to suppress their ideas. These include ancient aliens, ethnocentric revisionism, and historical revisionism. This podcast provides students with a critical tool to identify and debunk these attractive and pervasive modern myths. Popular media, especially television, is filled with wild claims of secret origins, hidden discoveries, and forgotten ancestors. For ancient aliens to destroy civilizations, we are used to being told that we have been either lied to by the governments or scientists willfully blind themselves to the truth. Why do history and archaeology so easily inspire endless theories about aliens, lost civilizations, dark conspiracy, apocalyptic predictions, and mysterious technologies. How do we tell the truth from the bunk? Misinformation has found a new natural habitat in the digital age. Thousands of forums, blogs, and alternative news sources amplify fake news and inaccurate information to such a degree that it impacts our collective intelligence. Researchers and policymakers are troubled by misinformation because it is presumed to energize or even carry false narratives that can motivate poor decision-making and dangerous behaviors. Yet, while a growing body of research has focused on how vital misinformation spreads, little work has examined how false narratives are constructed. In this podcast, we move beyond contingent-inspired approaches to explore how people build a false narrative. The history is based primarily on reinterpretations of conventional and scholarly sources and then provides an alternate account of unfolding events. I conclude that the link between misinformation, traditional knowledge, and false narratives is more complex than we often presume. Nakahama Monjuro Nakahama Monjiro, also known as John Monjiro, was one of the first Japanese people to visit the United States and an essential translator during the opening of Japan. During his early life, he lived as a simple fisherman in Nakano Hama, Tosa province. In 1841, 14-year-old Nakahama Monjiro and four friends were fishing when their boat was wrecked on the island of Torishima. The American whaleship John Howland, with Captain William H. Whitfield in command, rescued them. At the end of the voyage, four of them were left in Honolulu, however, Monjuro wanted to stay on the ship. Captain Whitfield took him back to the United States and briefly entrusted him to neighbor Ebenezer Akin, who enrolled Monjuro in the Oxford School in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. The boy studied English and navigation for a year, apprenticed to a cooper, and then, with Whitfield's help, signed on to the whale ship Franklin. After whaling in the South Seas, the crew put the Franklin into Honolulu in October 1847, where Monjuro again met his four friends. None were able to return to Japan, for this was during Japan's period of isolation when leaving the country was an offense punishable by death. When Captain Davis became mentally ill and was left in Manila, the crew elected a new captain, and Monjuro was made harpooner. The Franklin returned to New Bedford, Massachusetts, in September 1849 and paid off its crew, Monjuro was self-sufficient, with $350 in his pocket. Monjuro promptly set out by sea for the California Gold Rush. Arriving in San Francisco in May 1850, he took a steamboat up the Sacramento River, then went into the mountains. In a few months, he made about $600 and decided to find a way back to Japan. Monjuro arrived in Honolulu and found two of his companions were willing to go with him. He purchased a whaleboat, the Adventure, which was loaded aboard the bark Sarah Boyd and gifts from Honolulu's people. They sailed on December 17, 1850, and reached Okinawa on February 2, 1851. The three were promptly taken into custody, although treated with courtesy. 
After months of questioning, they were released in Nagasaki, and eventually returned home to Tosa, where Lord Yamauchi Toyoshiji awarded them pensions. Monjiro was appointed a minor official and became a valuable source of information. In September 1853, Monjiro was summoned to Edo, now known as Tokyo, questioned by the shogunate government, and made a Hatamoto. He would now give interviews only in service to the government. In token of his new status, he would wear two swords and needed a surname, he chose Nakahama, after his home village. In 1861, Monjiro was ordered to join the shogunate's expedition to the Bonin Islands, on which he acted as an interpreter. Monjiro detailed his travels in a report to the Tokugawa shogunate, which is kept today at the Tokyo National Museum. On July 8, 1853, when Commodore Matthew Perry's black ships arrived to force the opening of Japan, Monjiro became an interpreter and translator for the shogunate and was instrumental in negotiating the convention of Kanagawa. However, it appears that he did not contact the Americans directly at that time. Members of the Japanese delegation to the United States in 1860 sailed on the Kanrin Maru and the USS Powhatan. In 1860, Nakahama Monjiro participated in the Japanese embassy to the United States. He was appointed translator on board Kanrin Maru, Japan's first screw-driven steam warship purchased from the Dutch. Due to Japan's former policy of isolation, the crew had little experience on the open ocean. During a storm, her captain Katsu Keishu, Admiral Kimura, and much of the crew fell ill. Monjiro was put in charge and brought the ship to port safely. In 1870, during the Franco-Prussian War, Monjiro studied military science in Europe. He returned to Japan by way of the United States. He was formally received at Washington D. C., and he took advantage of this opportunity by traveling overland to Fairhaven, Massachusetts, to visit his foster father, Captain Whitfield. Eventually, Monjiro became a professor at the Tokyo Imperial University. Monjiro used his know-how of Western shipbuilding to contribute to the effort of the shogunate to build a modern navy. He translated Bowditch's American Practical Navigator into Japanese and taught English, naval tactics, and whaling techniques. He allegedly contributed to the construction of the Shohai Maru, Japan's first post-seclusion foreign-style warship. Monjiro was married three times and had seven children. In 1918, his eldest son, Dr. Nakahama Toikairo, donated a valuable sword to Fairhaven in token of his father's rescue and the town's kindness. It continued to be displayed in the town library even during World War II when anti-Japanese sentiment was very high. After thieves stole the sword in 1977, a replacement was gifted in 1982 and is still on display at the library. Among his accomplishments, Monjiro was probably the first Japanese person to take a train, ride in a steamship, officer an American vessel, and command a Trans-Pacific voyage. White House Riot the 1840 election pitted incumbent Jacksonian Democrat Martin Van Buren against Whig Party challenger and Battle of Tippecanoe hero William Henry Harrison. Four years earlier, Harrison had lost to Van Buren, but this time he prevailed. His running mate was former Democrat John Tyler of Virginia, giving rise to the famous campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler II. Harrison assumed the presidency on March 4, 1841, at the age of 68. He term limited himself by dying just 31 days later. The Whigs expected Tyler to faithfully implement the big government Whig program designed by Kentucky Senator Henry Clay, but were quickly disappointed. Even as the party's vice presidential candidate, Tyler never disguised his skepticism for Clay's central bank schemes, corporate welfare, and high tariffs. Clay ran the Senate, and his fellow Whigs controlled the House, where Clay had previously served a decade as Speaker. While President Tyler cautioned against creating a new central bank, Clay pressed forward with it in the summer of 1841. A bank bill passed both houses and went to Tyler's desk, where it died by veto on August 16. The president regarded it as unconstitutional partly because it would force the states to accept branches of the central bank within their boundaries, in direct competition with state chartered banks. Tyler began his veto message by reminding Congress that his opposition to a federal bank was long-standing. 
for 25 years, he pointed out, he expressed this view as a state and federal legislator. He had just sworn an oath to preserve, protect and defend the very constitution that Clay's bank scheme would undermine. To turn his back now on both the constitution and his conscience, wrote Tyler, would be to commit a crime which I would not willfully commit to gain any earthly reward, and which would justly subject me to the ridicule and scorn of all virtuous men. A central bank would enhance the federal government's power at the expense of the states, bestow benefits on a financial elite, and undermine the cause of sound money. Tyler wanted nothing to do with it. At 2 a.m. on August 18, a drunken mob gathered outside the White House portico. The Whigs erupted in a fury of anger. They blew horns, beat drums, threw rocks at the building, and fired guns into the night sky. The noise awakened Tyler and his family. Someone in the mansion's upstairs quarters lit candles, and the lights scared the crowd off. Another group arrived a few hours later, dragging a scarecrow-like figure. They set it afire, and John Tyler was burned in effigy. It was the most violent demonstration ever to occur at the White House complex. Security at the executive mansion was minimal in those days, it was not uncommon for visitors to walk right in unescorted. A drunken painter even threw rocks at President Tyler as he walked the South grounds. When an odd-looking package arrived by mail at the White House, Tyler feared a bomb, but it, fortunately, turned out to be a cake. Clay urged the Senate to override the president's veto, but he failed to get the required two-thirds vote. A new central bank bill with minor adjustments then passed both houses. On September 9, Tyler vetoed that one too. The second veto prompted a stream of abuse from Whig-friendly media that lasted for the rest of Tyler's term. On Monday, September 13, angry congressional Whigs formally expelled President Tyler from their ranks. Henry Clay pronounced to his political comrades that Tyler was a president without a party. Unlike the opportunistic and ambitious Clay, Tyler was a man of steadfast principles, and those are things that too many politicians, then and now, neither possess themselves nor can abide in others. Whig vitriol attacked Tyler for the remainder of his term. In the months after the bank vetoes, he also nixed Whig bills to hike tariffs. In response, his congressional opponents formed the first ever committee to explore whether the president should be impeached and named former president John Quincy Adams as its chair. Fearing a political backlash in the country, the committee's majority stopped short of recommending it. Released on August 16, 1842, its final report concluded that Tyler had committed offenses of the gravest character and deserved to be impeached. A few years later, when Clay realized his lifelong lust for the presidency would never materialize, he famously declared in a speech to the Senate, I would rather be right than be president. Time and again, he was neither. So a firestorm in Congress produced a riot at the White House. It was all about a bank which the country did not need and which the president rightly used his constitutional authority to thwart. The First Comic Book As an enthusiast of comic books won't hesitate to tell you, myself included, comic books have a long and robust history, one that extends far broader and deeper than the 20th century caped musclemen, partying teenagers, and wisecracking animals so many associate with the medium. The scholarship on comic book history, still a relatively young field, has more than once revised its conclusions on exactly how far back its roots go. But as of now, the earliest acknowledged comic book dates back to 1837. The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck was done by Switzerland's Rudolf Toffer, who had been considered in Europe as a creator of the picture story. He created the comic strip in 1827, making comic books that were highly successful and reprinted in many different languages. Several of them had English versions in America in 1846. The books remained in print in America until 1877. Also known as Histoire de Monsieur Vieux Bois, the original 1837 adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck earned Toffer the designation of the father of the modern comic. The series' pioneering use of bordered panels 
and the interdependent combination of words and pictures. Bootlegs and redrawn fakes were numerous because of the popularity of his work, in particular by the Paris publisher Albert. The first English language edition came in 1841, entitled The Adventures of Mr. Oadiah Oldbuck, produced by Wound's Gypsyography, copied by Alberg's unauthorized French edition. Robert Crunchank did the English language title page. In 1842, this edition was reprinted in the United States to supplement the magazine Brother Jonathan. Old book may not have qualified as a comic book by every possible definition of the word. It used captions instead of word balloons. Though that, as seen in Prince Valiant and early uh, Flash Gordon, isn't an absolute barrier. It didn't have continuing characters. Mr. Oldbuck's only appearance was in this one 40-page story, though not many people hold that, that as a necessary criterion. More importantly, the pictures carried relatively little of the narrative load. The reader can understand a bare-bones version of the story from the short captions alone. However, the images did add a great deal to the humor. Regrettably, contemporary critics, and to an extent, Toffer himself, who considered it a work targeted at children and the, quote, lower classes, end quote, couldn't see the innovations in all this. They wrote off Obadiah Oldbuck's harrowing yet strangely lighthearted pictorial stories of failed courtship, dueling, attempted suicide, robbery, drag, elopement, ghosts, stray bullets, attack dogs, double-crossing, and the threat of execution is mere trifles by an otherwise capable artist. The Oregon Trail The Oregon Trail was a roughly 2,000-mile route from Independence, Missouri, to Oregon City, Oregon, used by hundreds of thousands of American pioneers in the mid-1800s to emigrate west. The trail was arduous and snaked through Missouri and present-day Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Idaho, and Oregon. Without the Oregon Trail and the Oregon Donation Land Act in 1850, which encouraged settlement in the Oregon Territory, American pioneers would have been slower to settle the American West in the 19th century. By the 1840s, Manifest Destiny had Americans in the East eager to expand their horizons. While Lewis and Clark had made their way west from 1804 to 1806, merchants, traders, and trappers were also the first people to forge a path across the Continental Divide. But it was missionaries who blazed the Oregon Trail. Merchant Nathan Wyeth led the first missionary group west in 1834, where they built an outpost in present-day Idaho. Determined to spread Christianity to American Indians on the frontier, Dr. and Protestant missionary Marcus Whitman set out on horseback from the Northeast in 1835 to prove that travelers could traverse the westward trail to Oregon safely and further than ever before. Whitman's first attempt took him to the Green River Rendezvous, a meeting place for fur trappers and traders in the Rocky Mountains near present-day Daniel, Wyoming. Whitman married and set out again upon returning home, this time with his young wife Narcissa and another Protestant missionary couple. Whitman's small party had proved both men and women could travel west, although not easily. The party made it to the Green River Rendezvous, then faced a grueling journey along Native American trails across the Rockies using Hudson Bay Company trappers as guides. They finally reached Fort Vancouver, Washington, and built missionary posts nearby, Whitman's camp was at Wailatpu amid the Cayuse Indians. Narcissus' accounts of the journey were published in the East, and slowly more missionaries and settlers followed their path, which became known as the Whitman Mission Route. In 1842, the Whitman Mission was closed by the American Missionary Board, and Whitman went back to the East on horseback, where he lobbied for continued funding of his mission work. In the meantime, missionary Elijah White led over 100 pioneers across the Oregon Trail. When Whitman headed west yet again, he met up with a vast wagon train destined for Oregon. The group included 120 wagons, about 1,000 people, and thousands of livestock. Their trek began on May 22 and lasted five months. It effectively opened the floodgates of pioneer migration along the Oregon Trail and became known as the Great Emigration of 1843. 
Upon Whitman's return to his mission, his main goal shifted from converting American Indians to assisting white settlers. As more settlers arrived, the Coyuse became resentful and hostile. After a measles epidemic broke out in 1847, the Coyuse population was decimated, despite Whitman using his medical knowledge to help them. In the ongoing conflict, Whitman, his wife, and some mission staff were killed, natives took many more hostage for over a month. The incident sparked a seven-year war between the Coyuse and the federal government. Planning a five to six month trip across rugged terrain was no easy task and could take up to a year. Emigrants had to sell their homes, businesses, and any possessions they couldn't take with them. They also had to purchase hundreds of pounds of supplies, including flour, sugar, bacon, coffee, salt, rifles, and ammunition. By far, the essential item for a successful life on the trail was the covered wagon. It had to be sturdy enough to withstand the elements yet small and light enough for a team of oxen or mules to pull day after day. Most wagons were about 6 feet wide and 12 feet long. They were usually made of seasoned hardwood and covered with a large, oiled canvas stretched over wood frames. In addition to food supplies, the wagons were laden with water barrels, tar buckets, and extra wheels and axles. Contrary to popular belief, most of the wagons that journeyed the Oregon Trail were prairie schooners and, not more significant, heavier Conestoga wagons. It was critical for travelers to leave in April or May if they hoped to reach Oregon before the winter snows began. Departing in late spring also ensured there'd be ample grass along the way to feed livestock. As the Oregon Trail gained popularity, it wasn't unusual for thousands of pioneers to be on the path simultaneously, especially during the California Gold Rush. Depending on the terrain, wagons traveled side by side or single file. There were slightly different paths for reaching Oregon, but, for the most part, settlers crossed the Great Plains until they got their first trading post at Fort Kearney, averaging between 10 and 15 miles per day. From Fort Kearney, they followed the Platte River over 600 miles to Fort Laramie, and then ascended the Rocky Mountains, where they faced hot days and cold nights. Summer thunderstorms were shared and made traveling slow and treacherous. The settlers sighed relief if they reached Independence Rock, a huge granite rock that marked the halfway point of their journey, by July 4 because it meant they were on schedule. So many people added their name to the stone it became known as the Great Register of the Desert. After leaving Independence Rock, settlers climbed the Rocky Mountains to the South Pass. Then they crossed the desert to Fort Hall, the second trading post. From there, they navigated Snake River Canyon and, and a steep, dangerous climb over the Blue Mountains before moving along the Columbia River to the settlement of Dalles and finally to Oregon City. Some people continued south into California. Some settlers looked at the Oregon Trail with an idealistic eye, but it was anything but romantic. According to the Oregon California Trails Association, almost one in ten who embarked on the trail didn't survive. Most people died of dysentery, cholera, smallpox or flu, or in accidents caused by inexperience, exhaustion, and carelessness. It was not uncommon for people to be crushed beneath wagon wheels or accidentally shot to death, and many people drowned during dangerous river crossings. Travelers often left warning messages to those journeying behind them if there was an outbreak of disease, bad water, or hostile American Indian tribes nearby. As more and more settlers headed west, the Oregon Trail became a well-beaten path and an abandoned junkyard of surrendered possessions. It also became a graveyard for tens of thousands of pioneer men, women and children, and countless livestock. Over time, conditions along the Oregon Trail improved. Travelers built bridges and ferries to make water crossings safer. Settlements and other supply posts appeared along the way, which gave weary travelers a place to rest and regroup. Trail guides wrote guidebooks so settlers no longer had to bring an escort with them on their journey. Unfortunately, not all the books were accurate and left some settlers lost and in danger of running out of provisions. With the completion of the first transcontinental railroad in Utah in 1869, westward wagon trains decreased significantly as settlers chose the faster and more reliable mode of transportation. Still, as towns were established along the Oregon Trail, the route continued to serve thousands of emigrants with gold fever on their way to California. 
It was also the main thoroughfare for massive cattle drives between 1866 and 1888. By 1890, the railroads had all but eliminated the need to journey thousands of miles in a covered wagon. Settlers from the east were more than happy to hop a train and arrive in the west in one week instead of six months. Lysander Spooner Before FedEx or the United Parcel Service, there was another challenger to the United States Postal Service, the American Letter Mail Company. The American Mail Company was founded in 1844 by Lysander Spooner. Even before his battle with the U.S. Post Office, Spooner had quite the history as an activist. He was a self-educated lawyer, abolitionist, political philosopher, and supporter of the labor movement. In 1844, when Spooner started his company, postal rates were rising at cost as much 18 cents, about $4.50 in 2018, to send a letter from Boston to New York and 25 cents, or $6 today, to send a letter to Washington, D.C. Spooner believed he could deliver the mail at a lower cost. After discovering no law stating that a private citizen could not compete against a federal service, Spooner decided to act. An announcement of the mail company in the Daily Atlas of Boston on January 23, 1844, stated that the persons engaged in the enterprise, sick, contend that the laws of Congress prohibiting private mails are unconstitutional, and they are anxious to have them tested on this point as speedily as possible. Lysander Spooner, of Worcester, Massachusetts, is said to be the principal in this enterprise. The American Letter Mail Company had offices in New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston. It delivered letters daily between the cities, with delivery twice a day to New York and Philadelphia, all at the cost of six cents per each half ounce. Those using the American Mail Company service would purchase stamps and attach them to letters. From there, agents would travel by rail or steamboats, carrying their letters in handbags. Once the agents arrived in serviced cities along the routes, postal workers would hand over the notes to messengers, then deliver the letters to their specific destinations. An editorial in the Boston Atlas on March 1, 1844, said, The question of constitutionality, in this case, is interesting. It is certainly remarkable, and not without a good bearing to this company's reasoning, that while in the old Articles of Confederation, it was declared that Congress shall have the sole and exclusive right and power of establishing and regulating post offices, when the Constitution came to be adopted, the phrasing was altered. The words sole and exclusive were omitted. Among the various prohibitions upon the state government, it is also worthy of notice, there is no one against establishing post roads and post offices. We shall certainly watch the progress of this company with interest. They have presented the matter of post office reform in a new and original aspect. Although the citizens were supportive of this new cheaper rate service, Congress was not. Soon, government officials warned railroads that they could not transport mail from the American Mail Company if they wanted to continue carrying U.S. Postal Service mail. This soon put a dent in Spooner's business. Again, in the Atlas on March 1, 1844, a Baltimore Sun article was reprinted telling of the fate of Spooner's agents if they were caught with mail on trains. On Saturday evening last, at about 7 o'clock, when the cars were about to start for Philadelphia from the Pratt Street Depot, Mr. Fisher, an agent of the American Mail Company, appeared as a passenger and being suspected by the railroad agent of being a private mail carrier, he was informed of the difficulty that lay in the way of his going on as such. He gave up the key to his trunk that it might be ascertained whether or not it contained mailable matter, and took his seat in one of the cars, in which he was accosted by Hugo McKeldry, Esquire, one of the directors of the railroad company, to whom he made the admission that he was an agent of the American Mail Company. Mr. McKeldry, therefore, informed him that he could not go on, and as he manifested an unwillingness to leave the cars, Mr. McKeldry took hold of him and ejected him from the car. The train then proceeded on its way to Philadelphia Baltimore Sun. Another agent of Spooner's company found himself arrested and fined for transporting letters via a railroad car over the U.S. Post Road. Eventually, a U.S. judge sided with Spooner's company. He ruled that railroads were not to be held responsible if their passengers were letter carriers who brought mail aboard a steamboat or train, unbeknownst to them. The U.S. Circuit Court also upheld the not guilty vote. After several more court battles, 
the government decided there was only one option left. The postmaster general came before Congress and asked for permission to lower rates. In March of 1845, a new lower rate was set with letters of less than half an ounce being allowed to be sent up to 300 miles for 5 cents. Newspapers, too, could be delivered at no charge within a 30-mile radius. Yet Lysander Spooner was not done with his challenge to the U.S. Post Office. In 1851, Congress once again decreased postal rates to 3 cents for delivery anywhere in the country. In response to the new lower rates, he, too, lowered his rates. Spooner was finally satisfied. He became known as the father of the three-cent stamp, and his company was disbanded. Spooner himself died in 1887 after a long career of rabble-rousing and activism. What hath God wrought? Samuel Morse was an American inventor and painter. After establishing his reputation as a portrait painter in his middle age, Morse contributed to the invention of a single wire telegraph system based on European telegraphs. He was a co-developer of Morse code and helped to develop the commercial use of telegraphy. While returning by ship from Europe in 1832, Morse encountered Charles Thomas Jackson of Boston, a well-schooled man in electromagnetism. Witnessing various experiments with Jackson's electromagnet, Morse developed the concept of a single wire telegraph. He set aside his painting, The Gallery of the Louvre. The original Morse telegraph, submitted with his patent application, is part of the National Museum of American History collections at the Smithsonian Institution. In time, the Morse code that he developed would become the primary language of telegraphy in the world. It is still the standard for rhythmic transmission of data. Meanwhile, William Cook and Professor Charles Wheatstone had learned of the Wilhelm Weber and Carl Gauss electromagnetic telegraph in 1833. They had reached the stage of launching a commercial telegraph before Morse, despite starting later. In England, Cook became fascinated by electrical telegraphy in 1836, four years after Morse. Aided by his more significant financial resources, Cook abandoned his primary subject of anatomy and built a small electrical telegraph within three weeks. Wheatstone also was experimenting with telegraphy and understood that a single large battery would not carry a telegraphic signal over long distances. He theorized that numerous small batteries were far more successful and efficient in this task. Cook and Wheatstone formed a partnership and patented the electrical telegraph in May 1837, and within a short time had provided the Great Western Railway with a 13-mile stretch of the telegraph. However, Cook and Wheatstone's multiple wire signaling method would be overtaken by Morse's cheaper method within a few years. Morse encountered the problem of getting a telegraphic signal to carry over more than a few hundred yards of wire. His breakthrough came from the insights of Professor Leonard Gale, who taught chemistry at New York University. With Gale's help, Morse introduced extra circuits or relays at frequent intervals and was soon able to send a message through 10 miles of wire. This was the significant breakthrough he had been seeking. Morse and Gale were quickly joined by Alfred Vail, an enthusiastic young man with excellent skills, insights, and money. At the Speedwell Ironworks in Morristown, New Jersey, on January 11, 1838, Morse and Vail made the first public demonstration of the electric telegraph. Although Morse and Alfred Vail had done most of the research and development in the ironworks facilities, they chose a nearby factory house as the demonstration site. Without the repeater, Morse devised a system of electromagnetic relays. This was the key innovation, as it freed the technology from being limited by distance in sending messages. The range of the telegraph was limited to two miles, and the inventors had pulled two miles of wires inside the factory house through an elaborate scheme. The first public transmission, with the message, a patient waiter is no loser, was witnessed by a mostly local crowd. Morse traveled to Washington, D.C., in 1838, seeking federal sponsorship for a telegraph line but was not successful. He went to Europe, seeking both support and patents, but in London discovered that Cook and Wheatstone had already established priority. After his return to the U.S., Morse finally gained financial backing from Maine Congressman Francis Ormond Jonathan Smith. 
This funding may be the first instance of government support to a private researcher, especially funding for applied research. Morse made his last trip to Washington, D.C., in December 1842, stringing wires between two committee rooms in the Capitol, and sent messages back and forth to demonstrate his telegraph system. Congress appropriated $30,000, equal to $833,250 today, in 1843 to construct an experimental 38-mile telegraph line between Washington, D.C., and Baltimore along the right-of-way of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. An impressive demonstration occurred on May 1, 1844, when news of the Whig Party's nomination of Henry Clay for U.S. President was telegraphed from the party's convention in Baltimore to the Capitol building in Washington. On May 24, 1844, the line was officially opened as Morse sent the now famous words, What hath God wrought, from the Supreme Court chamber in the basement of the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C., to the Bando's Mount Clare station in Baltimore. Annie Ellsworth chose these words from the Bible, her father U.S. Patent Commissioner Henry Leavitt Ellsworth, championed Morse's invention and secured early funding. His telegraph could transmit 30 characters per minute. In May 1845, the Magnetic Telegraph Company was formed to build telegraph lines from New York City toward Philadelphia, Boston, Buffalo, New York, and the Mississippi. Telegraphic lines rapidly spread throughout the United States in the next few years, with 12,000 miles of wire laid by 1850. Morse at one time adopted Wheatstone and Carl August von Steinle's idea of broadcasting an electrical telegraph signal through a body of water or down steel railroad tracks or anything conductive. He went to great lengths to win a lawsuit for the right to be called inventor of the telegraph and promoted himself as being an inventor. But Alfred Vail also played an essential role in developing the Morse code, which was based on earlier codes for the electromagnetic telegraph. You've been listening to the RPTM Podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.